The car could be a mysterious place, a creative place, a reflective place. And no, I will not let you drive my car. Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insight into the creative process of storytelling. Folks, you know, maybe I'll let you drive my car. I mean, if you're insured and everything works out perfectly, because then it would give me a chance to look on my phone more and stuff like that. But you know what? I love this movie. And we talk later about what it means to drive in a car and, and be driven. And uh, this movie's great. And if you don't know, this was a virtual event that I did. Um, you could sign up on my screening list from wherever you are in the world. A lot of them are geotagged to be United States specific, but sometimes they're open to everyone. And uh, I was really glad to be able to do this. We had a huge crowd. It sold out within 90 minutes and they got a 48 hour viewing period to watch the movie for free and then to watch this Q&A first. And I got to say, I was so pleased to have writer, director Ryosuke Hamaguchi with me today because he's just so talented and I love Drive My Car. It's it's such a great film on so many levels. And, you know, if you're an artist, if you've ever worked in theater, just seeing all the rehearsals and being a part of the staging of this show and, and then the great storytelling in the movie, there's so many great things to talk about. And uh, I know you'll dig this episode. Now, I have a few notes for you about this episode. Here's the first one. This was just a brain freeze on my part. The protagonist of the movie is Yasuki Kafuku. And for whatever reason, I just in my notes and my questions referred to him as Yasuki, uh, his first name. Mr. Hamaguchi, during his answers, would refer to him as Kafuku. And so he was he was taking his last name. So when you hear that differential about us using two different names for one character, I just wanted you to know why that's happening. And honestly, I had a brain freeze. I don't know why I didn't adapt to what Mr. Hamaguchi was saying. And I feel like such a fool for not doing it. Oh, but hey, don't worry. That wasn't the only time I did it because I also did it for the character of Koshi Takasuki. So that's the young actor that is cast in Uncle Vanya. And he's also a major character. So we talk about him a lot as well. Oh, look, you will know who we are talking about, but it is strange. So when I'm bringing up Koshi and Mr. Hamaguchi is bringing up Takasuki, that we're both talking about the same person because it's Koshi Takasuki. And I profusely apologize for confusing you. Now, here's a note about the interview itself. You're watching on YouTube on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, and you're listening in iTunes and Spotify to the long version where I let all of Mr. Hamaguchi's answers play out while he's speaking Japanese because I would never want to silence a filmmaker. I think it's important for people to hear a filmmaker in their own voice. And of course, the translator then translates what he's saying. I know this isn't for everyone. So I also put up a shortened version where we let about 15 to 20 seconds of Mr. Hamaguchi speaking occur. And then we cut directly to the translator. In both versions, I cut out everything that the translator was saying to Mr. Hamaguchi because I felt there was no need for you to hear him repeat the question. I got to tell you, even though I had to do two different cuts of the same interview, I was really happy to do it because I love living in a world where our technology allows us to have these conversations and for us to get them out there to everybody and to allow you to choose the way that you want to hear it. Now, if you're not on my invite list, you could always go to backstory.net slash events, and that will get you signed up for these free virtual events that we do. And eventually for our free in-person screening series that I've run in LA since 2003, uh, that has been postponed because of the pandemic. And I can't wait to be able to get back into theaters with folks, but I'm really happy that we're going virtual right now. So if you're not on my current invite, list, please go join us by going to backstory.net slash events. And while you're surfing around online, I hope you check out Backstory Magazine over at backstory.net. You know, you could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And folks, we just published our winter issue, our cool Dune cover. There is so much cool stuff in there. We've even been adding articles to the magazines because we're digital. We could do that. So I hope you'll check out our table of contents over at backstory.net, see what's inside. And if you've never read us before and you want to test drive us, I hope you'll read the free issue. And if you like what you see, I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber. And if you want to become a subscriber, I'm here to sweeten the deal by offering you discount coupon code SAVE5. That'll save you $5 off a of one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. Look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page support my passion project. So thanks for considering. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our interview with writer-director Ryosuke Hamaguchi about his latest film, Drive My Car. I absolutely loved your film, but I'm going to go back in time a little first um, to give people a sense of who you are and your creative habit. 
And when I was looking through your past projects, I saw that you directed your own version of Stanislaw Lem's Solaris <laughs> while you were in college. And I'm just curious if that was something that was ever released or if it was just a student project because I'm a big fan of the book and all other versions of the film. えっとですね、これは私が大学院の1年目の時に、えー、まあ先生が黒沢清さんという、まあこれもあの有名な監督ですけれども、あの黒沢清さんが、あの、まあ課題として、えー、このスタニスワフレームのソラリスを映画化せよという、えーテーマが出ました。で、まあ、脚本のコンペティションが行われて、で、私の脚本が選ばれて、で、90分程度の映画として完成しました。えー、まあ、その学生の映画としては、学内では評判良かったんですけれども、じゃあ、外で上映できるのかということで、まあ、調べてみたら、まあ、あの、当然、ソダーバーグが権利を持っているということで、あの、これは外に出せないということで、あの、大学以外で上映されたことは、まあ、ない状況ですね。あのただ、まあ、そのことを少し安心しているというか、そのことでちょっとほっとしているっていうのも正直なとこなんですけれど。So, um, this film was made when I was a graduate student, my first year in grad school. My teacher was、um, Kiyoshi Kurosawa、um, in school, a fantastic director, and he gave this assignment of adapting Solaris. And、um, there was a script competition, and the script that I wrote won. And so we turned it into a 90 minute film.、Uh, and as a student film, everybody really loved the film in school. And so we considered screening outside of the school. But of course, Soderbergh has the rights to the film. So we could not screen it anywhere outside of the school, which I am actually secretly a little bit relieved. What was your biggest lesson on, on, on your Solaris version? What was something that was a trial by fire for you that helped you on your projects thereafter? あの、あくまでその学生時代の修作として作ったものではあって、まあ、シネマスコープをやってみて、まあ、シネマスコープというのはお金がない状態でやると本当に、あの、スカスカの画面になってしまうんだなということを学んだりしましたけれども、ごくごく単純に、まあ、レムの,あの世界観というか、まあ、その惑星サラリスっていうもの、えー、が非常になってですか、興味深い存在であるなということは思いました。この、あの、なんですかね、思念を持った。あの思考する惑星という存在自体を、まあ、面白いと思いました。いつか、まあ、SF みたいなものを作ることがあったら、まあ、その影響というのが、まあ、前面に出てくるところがあるかもしれません。This was a film that I made when I was a student, so it's tricky to think about what exactly I learned, but、um, one thing was shooting in CinemaScope.、Um, I realized that with no money, it looks very empty. You can't film the frame very well. Um, so that was one thing, but it, the,、um, the story of Solaris was very fascinating to me. And,、um, just the entire theme of the film was something that I think if I were to make a science fiction film one day,、um, I think that aspect would be very interesting to explore. I really hope one day you do make a science fiction film that we could all see that is not trapped in film school for sure. Well, so getting to tonight's film,、uh, when, did, when did you realize that you wanted to adapt? The Haruki Murakami short story from his 2014 collection, Men Without Women, into a film? I know it's a very common question to ask, but I just want to give our people a starting point. まあ、この物語の中に自分がそれまでも扱ってきたような、映画の中で扱ってきたような題材が、まあ、含まれていたからだと思います。それはの乗り物の中での会話で。そのことによって深まっていく関係性みたいなものがあったり、またその主人公の職業が俳優ということで、まあ、演じるという主題が入って、これはその実際自分が映画でよくやっていた、あのよく取り扱っていたテーマでもあって、あの現実味はその当時全くなかったですけれども、あの、これはいつか自分が映画化することができるものかもしれないな、ということは、あの、予感をしました。で、その5年後ぐらい、あの、プロデューサーから村上春樹さんの短編を映画化しないかと言われたときに、あ、まあ、基本的に、その村上春樹さんの作品を映像化するということは、いろいろハードルが高いというか難しいことだと思うんですけれども、これだったら自分はできるかもしれないということをそのプロデューサーにお伝えして、あのドライマイカの企画が始まりました。So,、um, it was actually first published in 2013 in a magazine, 
and um, someone recommended it to me, I think mainly because it dealt with many topics that I had explored in the past in my film, um, and uh, especially these sort of interesting conversations that unfold on transportation or things that you ride. Um, and also it was about an actor, which is also a theme that I enjoyed exploring in the past. And so I always thought that um, I could make this into a film, um, but that it would be, you know, really difficult um, to make Murakami uh, stories into films. And so, um, but when a producer asked me about five years later, um, I thought, okay, this this story, I think I could I could do and uh, turn into a film. I'm glad you did. I want to talk about your writing process for a second. When you sit down to write an original screenplay or even like this, technically an adaptation. How important is outlining to your process? アウトラインがなしに、あの、仕事ができるとは、ま、全く思わないです。あの、そのアウトラインを、ま、なんとかこれでいけるかもしれないというものができて、ま、初めてその詳細を、あの、じゃあ一体どのようにしてこのアウト
do you give yourself a page count that you want to write each day as a goal or a certain amount of hours that you want to spend writing? あのこれもそういう書き方ができたらいいなというふうに思うんですけれどもちなみに村上春樹さんやっぱりその毎朝毎朝本当にちょっとずつ決められた時間だけ書いて進めていくということをされているようですけれども、まあ、やっぱり自分はそういうことができなくてもう書けるときにまあどこまでも書きあの書けないときはずっと書けないっていうことを繰り返していって気がついたら何か全部できているっていう感じですねなんか本当にあの法則がない感じです I wish I had some sort of structure that I could follow something like that.、Um, by the way, as a side note,、uh, Murakami, he writes a little bit every morning and he has a very set time that he writes and that's how he progresses his stories.、Um, for me, I just write whenever I can and I keep going until I can't. So、um, it is very irregular and there are times where I just can't write for long periods and there are times where I write a lot in a short time. So it's very irregular. Tell us about how you wrote with your co writer, Takamasa O,、oh, and how you split up duties. Did you write separately and send it back and forth, or did you write together? あの、まあ、読む役割、えー、読んで、まあ、意見を言う役割っていうのを基本的にはしてくれました。で、大江さんは、まあ、基本的には演劇に非常に詳しい方だったので、あの、今回その共同脚本に入っていただいたのも、まあ、その演劇の設定上のリアリティっていうものを、あの、とても、あの、まあ、僕自身は演劇の素人なので、まあ、その大江さんの視点から、これは、ま、現実と即している、即していない、えー、っていうのをジャッジしてもらいました。プラス、まあ、自分が特に大江さんにまずお願いをしたのは、まあ、一番最初のパートの音の物語ですね。この音の物語を自分以外の人が書いた方がいいと思ったので、ま,あ、まず書いてもらいました。で、えー、っと受け取ったものを、まあ、引き取って、えー、自分の方でそれをリライトしたり、えー、しています。で、基本的には、まあ、自分が書く、で、大江さんが読むっていう、そういう役割分担をしていたと思います。Uh, basically, I don't think、um, he would mind me saying that I mainly wrote this film.、Um, his role was really to read and、uh, give me his opinion.、Um, he is very experienced and good with,、um, with the play world and so,、um, and playwriting. And so、uh, I asked him for sort of、uh, to check in terms of reference for how realistic some of the scenes were that I was writing.、Um, Also, the story that Otto tells in the film、uh, in the beginning, but also that we find out throughout the film,、um, I asked him to write because I wanted someone else to write that story.、Um, so I received that story and sort of rewrote it a bit as well. But mostly it was a process of me writing and getting feedback from him. That's wild. We're definitely going to talk about Oto's story later. You know, in, in the film, our protagonist, Yusuke, drives around his red sob, practicing his lines for Uncle Vanya. And his car is a sacred, creative space for him, almost a refuge from the, from the world around him. And I've had the pleasure of interviewing screenwriter Aaron Sorkin before. And he has said that he likes to get in his car and listen to music from when he was in high school to clear his mind and to think of ideas for a script that he's writing and to run things around in his head. I myself, for most of my life, have sometimes gone on night drives with a pen and paper to kind of jot down ideas and clear my head. And I'm curious for, for a movie that has so much time spent in a car, is that a creative habit of yours? Is that something you like to do? To clear your head, to come up with ideas, is a car a creative space for you? Hi. Eh, so, this is, well, I don't know, 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 I don't あの、書き方はイレギュラーだというふうに言いましたけれども、まあ、一つ法則があるとすれば、まあ、徹底的にインプットをするということですね。何がしかインプットをする。それはまあ原則の本を読むのでもいいし、今回の場合だったら、バーニャおじさんを何度も読むということでもよいし、あの、村上春樹さんの他の小説を読んだり、まあ、他の映画を見たり、えー、まあ何がしかインプットをすると。で、そのインプットを
、あの、意識的にではなく、まあ、整理をする時間を取るっていうことがとても大事だと思います。自分の場合、一番それがよく起こるのは、まあ、シャワーを浴びていたりする時間帯に、あの、本当にシャワーを浴びていると、まあ、一旦その物語のことを考えることから離れると思うんですけれども、そういう物語から離れたときに、自然と、あの、話が組み上がっていく。インプットされたものが整っていくような、あの感覚を味わうことがあります。で、おそらくその車に乗るっていうことは、まあ一番その優れた、そのインプットと、まあ整理の方法なんじゃないかというふうな気がします。外から入ってくる風景が刺激となってインプットとなる一方で、おそらくその物語のことを考えることからちょっと離れられる時間でもあるんだと思います。そういう時に無意識が勝手に自分の物語を整理してくれるような感覚はあります。なので、あの、ひたすらインプットをして、まあ、どこか、まあ、リラックスをして、その無意識に整理をしてもらうっていうことは、なんかとても大事なことなんじゃないかと思います。So, I don't drive and I don't own a car,、um, but I do understand what you're talking about. And,、um, I,、uh, did mention that my writing process is quite irregular, but what is very regular is that I always Maintain a consistent input, whether it's a book or the original, or, you know, for me, it was Uncle Vanya or、um, other films.、Um, I'm always inputting something. And so、um, I also, you know, need time to organize those thoughts and ideas that originate from that input. And the greatest place for that is always when I'm taking a shower. Taking a shower allows me to get away from it all and just,、um, and it sort of, Puts itself together almost automatically, it seems. It's sort of the input gets organized. And so,、um, what I do is, you know, I get away from the process of writing just a little bit, and the subconscious sort of kicks in and helps organize all the stuff that is built up. And so, that relaxation and the work of the、uh, subconscious.、Um, Sort of categorizing and organizing is really important for me. This is a three hour film, and I'm curious how long your first draft of your screenplay was and how long your production draft was if the page count changed. It's a two hour film. 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 It's a two まあ、プロデューサーからきつく言われていたのは2時間ぐらいすということを言われていて、あの、まあ、自分としては、まあ、じゃあこのリハーサルのシーンを編集で、まあ、なんか必要なところだけ残すようにするんでって言って、まあ、やっていたんですけれども、まあ、結果的になんでか3時間になってしまったっていうことですね。Um, so it was by page count, the, the final draft was,、um, two and a half hours long.、Um, and,、uh, it included a lot of rehearsals for the play. Um, and so, what the producer had told me、um, was, we have to keep this under two hours and 20 minutes. And、um, so, we were、uh, filming and we had all of these rehearsal scenes. And we assumed it would be shorter, but a lot of the rehearsals were great and we ended up keeping a lot of it. And so, It became the length of it now. How many pages was it? これは英語の換算とは違うので、あの日本だと1ページ1分という換算をして、まあ、それが150ページだったと。So,、uh, it might be different in the US, but、um, in Japan we think of one page as one minute, and it was 150、uh, pages. Okay, very briefly, because I, I really want to get into more about the film, but did you ever consider turning it into any sort of an episodic TV show? Because I love the film. But I also could have seen it going that way. これは全くないです。まあ、いまだにその結局、あの、映像作品を、まあ、集中力を持って体験する一番の環境は、まあ、映画館だと、まあ、信じてやまないところがあるので、あの、特にこの映画、集中力を持ってみなくては、まあ、その魅力そのものを捉え損なうというところがあると思っているので、まあ、映画にするという、まあ、考え以外はあまりなかったというところがあります。Um, not at all. I,、um, I believe that the best way to experience visuals, to experience films, is in the theater. And I think if you don't with this film,、um, you miss out on a lot without that concentrated focus. Um, and so it's the exact same for this film. I never thought about any other format. What was your budget and schedule? It's a very good thing. 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 It
撮影期間だったと思います。Um, for the budget, I'm not sure if that's public information, so I'm gonna refrain from answering, but the shoot was one and a half month. Oh, okay, great. Well, so obviously, folks who are watching this as part of our virtual screening have just seen the film, so they, they know the spoilers. But if you are tuning into this as a podcast in iTunes or Spotify or on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, Make sure to press pause if you don't want any spoilers because we are going to get into the spoilers right now and then go see Drive My Car and then please come back and join us for the rest of the conversation. Okay, so we're now in the spoiler section. And you know, right from the start, you show us just about the best way ever to break a story for a writer, which is during sex. And it's, it's a fascinating concept. And it's, it's, it's wild because when Yusuke and Otto are having sex, she explains a story that she's working on for her next TV show. And she's so into the moment that she can't entirely remember it the next day and needs him to tell the story back to her. Tell us about how that dynamic was created. Was it something from the short story or something that you then? Expanded on that covers the course of the movie because we come back to the story she's telling. I just think it's a wild concept and it put a smile on my face as a writer from the beginning as possibly the greatest way ever to break a story. <laughs> だと思います。えっ、ー、と、正確にはこれドライブマイカーの原作ではないのですけれども、あの原作には載ってない部分なんですが、女のいない男たちという、その、えー、短編集、同じ短編集の中のシェーラザードという、えー、小説の要素ですね。そのセックスをすると物語を思いつくという。ただまあ彼女は別にその忘れるわけではなくて、あの、それをそのまま語ることができるんですけれども、今回は、あの、セックスをすると、それを、まあ、おぼろげながら語って、そ,、えー、それを、まあ、夫が、まあ、朝、えー、まあ、昼ですね。昼、より意識がはっきりした時間に、あの、語り直すという設定にしてます。で、このことによって、この物語が、まあ、単なる物語ではなくて、まあ、セックスと結びついて、しかも、まあ、誰かに受け渡されるものになるということ。で、このことが、えっ、ー、と、まあ、後で、あの、必要になってくるというふうに思いました。というのは、その原作でも高月と、あの、妻が、音が、えー、本当に関係をしたのかというのは、あの、まあ、読者の興味の中心なんですけども、そこは究極的に曖昧になっている。で、その曖昧さは保ちたいとは思いましたけれども、あの、家福がそれを確信するのでなくては、まあ、面白くないと思いました。家福が、まあ、このもの、語りを知っているということは、この男性は確実にあの妻とセックスをしたはずだというふうに、家福は思うだろうということですね。そのことがとてもあの大事なことだと思いました。この物語をセックスと関連づけたアイテムとして使うことができるということで、この要素をあのこの映画の中には取り入れています。So, uh, thank you, first of all.、Um, this bit、uh, was not in the original of Drive My Car. But it was、uh, included in one of the series of shorts that was published with Drive My Car. And in that story, there was a woman who thinks of stories、uh, while she's having sex, but she doesn't forget them. She can remember them. And so,、um, in our version,、um, she's sort of in this almost altered state and then can remember these stories in the morning only when her husband re- recites them back to her. So, the important aspect here, though, is for me, is that. The stories are tied to the act of having sex. And so, and the stories sort of get passed on to someone else. And so, for instance, when Takatsuki, you know, shares the continuation of the story through the fact that he even knows this story, even though to that point it was, it's sort of vague whether, you know, the audience knows whether it was indeed him that was sleeping with her,、um, with, his, with his wife or not, he gains the confidence. In that moment, our character gains confidence in that moment that they did indeed sleep together because he knows the continuation of the story. And that's, a, that's an interesting moment. I'm going to jump around on my questions because I was going to get into that, that a bit later. But, but right from the start, we see that, that they've had the affair. It's a great setup and payoff in the film as Yusuke soon discovers his wife is cheating on him with the young actor from her show, Koshi. And Yasuki later casts him in a version of Chekhov's Uncle Vanya that he's directing, even though he's the wrong age. But it's a, it's a wild concept because the audience is in on the secret that Yasuki knows that they had the affair. 
And it adds great subtext throughout the film and tension as to when that secret is going to be revealed. So tell us about the importance of infusing a secret like that into this story and finding the right way to finally have all the cards laid out on the table. Hi. まず重要なポイントとして指摘をしておきたいのは、まあ、家福はその寝ている男性の顔は見ていないということです。そしてつまり観客も見てはいない。なので、まあ、おそらく話の流れから高槻以外の人物を、えー、想像することは難しいように話自体はできているけれども、あの確信はまあ誰も持てないし、まあ、違う可能性もあるという状態で、えー、このキャスティングはされていると。なので、えー家福がそれをする理由というのも、それと同様に多少キャスティングを高槻にするというのも、あの多少曖昧な、理由が曖昧なことになっているとは思います。ただ、まあ、これあまりはっきりしたものより曖昧さをまあ自分が好んでいるので、あのそのようにしましたが、あの基本的にそのような緊張感、おそらく家福はまあ分からない中で、まあ、なんとか手がかりを得たいという気持ちもあって、おそらくキャスティングをしているということ、そのことが観客に伝わると、あの本当にただリハーサルをしているだけの場面なんですけれども、あの緊迫感が生まれるようになります。でこの緊迫感というのは、この長さの映画にとっては非常に重要なものです。ただ一方で、あの、まあ、こ,このようにある種の秘密を作ればサスペンスを作り出すことはできるんですけれど、でそれを最後の最後まで明かさないでいくということもできます。でこうすれば、その観客に対して、あの、ある種、まあ、ずっと緊張感を与えて終わらせることはできるんですけれど、それはそれでまあ観客に対するまあ裏切りのようなものだと思っています。なので、あの、秘密をあらわにする瞬間というのは必要だと思います。それは観客との信頼関係のために必要なものだと思います。ただ、秘密があらわになるということはサスペンスが解消されるということであって、あの、それは映画がつまらなくなってしまう可能性のある瞬間だと思います。なので、まあ、必要なのはこの秘密があらわにされる瞬間に、全く新たなステージに、えー、物語を移してしまうということです。あんまそれによって新たに解決されるべき問題を作り出すのでなければ、この秘密を明かすっていうアクションは、ただ映画のステージを下げてしまう、グレードを下げてしまうだけになってしまうと思います。I want one thing to be clear: Kafuku has not seen the man's face when he witnesses his wife having sex with someone.、Um, and so, and neither does the audience. And so, in the story, it's a little bit vague.、Um, and There's no proof、um, for him when he decides to cast the young man.、Uh, but the reason that he decides to cast him is also somewhat vague.、Um, and I like that vagueness. I wanted,、um, he, he cast him partly because he wanted to gain more information and find out if he was indeed the person who slept with his wife.、Um, And it builds tension in all of the scenes from that point forward, as you mentioned,、um, which is very important for a film of this length.、Um, and the suspense,、um, you have the choice as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, to keep the,、uh, keep the resolution from the audience until the end, or not even、uh, you know, allow the suspense to dissolve. Um, after the film ends, but I believe that would be a betrayal.、Um, You'd be betraying the audience and betraying the trust、um, that would have been built during the film between the filmmaker and the audience. And so,、um, however, on the other hand, if you give away secrets、um, in, in a film or resolve a point of tension, then that can also become a point when the film becomes completely uninteresting. Um, so, the moment that these secrets are given, given away or solved,、um, they need to bring up an even bigger question or sort of catapult the audience into a direction where there's an even bigger mystery to solve. That's a fascinating answer. And let's talk about that scene where all the cards are laid on the table. The, the payoff comes when, when Koji and Yusuke share a ride, and it's finally brought up that. He was the person that had the affair with Otto, and they're talking about the stories. And basically, Yusuke doesn't know the end of the story, and Koji reveals that he does and tells it to him. 
And it's, it's a wild payoff. When did you realize that that was going to be the payoff of, of him being able to finish the story that Yasuki was desiring to know the ending to? Well, と え、今、あの、高月はその音とセックスをしていたのだという解釈がありましたけれども、それが絶対的な解釈というわけではないと思います。So, um, this this bit of storytelling is something that I've been working on for a long time. Um, and I think it's something that I've been working on for a long time. So, um, this this bit of storytelling um was in the uh outlining stage um that that uh it came up for me. And the moment that I wrote that was when I realized, okay, I think this might be a good story. The sex being linked to her storytelling is a interaction that happens between Kafuku and Oto. So um, because it's just those two, no one else knows about this. But when he hears, and it doesn't necessarily mean that just because Takatsuki heard the uh, the story, the continuation of the story, that it's guaranteed that he actually had sex with his wife. But that's what Kafuku thinks. That's 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 how he interprets it. And so I think also the young actor who played Takatsuki, he did a great job of being very mysterious in that scene. So it was left quite vague. You know, there was this sort of um, almost uh, like pure young innocence. And there's also this vagueness that comes with it. So the balance of these two things, I think, is what was really interesting in that moment. And um, the fact that there is no concrete definite uh, evidence or information, I think is what makes that whole interaction really fascinating. It was great. And the way you filmed it was with a very bold choice of rather than showing Yusuke's face, we stay on Koji. And it was, it was kind of a wild choice because you stay on him the entire time that he's telling the story. And I'm sure Yusuke was trying to keep his composure and was going through self doubts about whether or not this meant that, you know, that was the person that was having the affair. As, as you had said, it was a doubt cast in his mind. Tell us about that bold choice to keep it focused on Koshi the pretty much entire time where he reveals the ending of the story. ま、え、the simple answer is I didn't feel we really needed to show the reverse on uh, on Kapuku, on uh, Yusuke, because uh, Takatsuki Koshi, his side was just 
so wonderful. His performance, his expression, everything was just so on point. And um, we shot both angles, of course, but it was in the edit that I decided that the most, I wanted the scene to feel really mysterious. And the most mysterious choice was to just show um, him. And so it wasn't the sort of expression or performance that said, like, that gave like definite concrete information to the audience. And that's what I really liked about it. And um, I think that was uh, a really clear and easy decision to make for me. Just a comment. I mean, it's a fun moment because it's left to the audience interpretation. But to me, with all the stuff about in Uncle Vanya, you know, one of the characters being referred to as a Don Juan, it seems like Koshi is just, you know, exploding with these facts that he's been dying to tell anyone and he can't tell anyone. And almost a hint of bragging about it, but, but that's not a question. That's just a comment. I'll let you translate it. It was just showing my love for the scene. Thank you very much. And I would also love to hear your answer about the story itself that Otto is telling because mm -hmm. in her story, in the end, when a robber breaks into the house, the teenage girl is said to stab him in the left eye. Mm -hmm. And that is also where Yusuke is diagnosed with glaucoma mm -hmm. earlier in the film. And there's kind of a direct link between the two. And it's just fascinating to see that woven into the story. I'm just curious if you want to tell us what that link means to you. あの、ま、リンクを発見していくようなところがあります。えっと、その左目を指すのはでも普通にま、多くの人が右利きだからですね。右利きじゃないとその男性の力に対抗できないから、おそらく左目を指すんだとは思います。ただそれは明らかにま、下
off a one-year subscription. And also you could use those same credentials to sign into the iPad app as well. There's a lot going on over at Backstory.net. So I hope you check out what we're doing on our blog, be it our Sundance reviews or just some of our free excerpts from the magazine or free full articles. We're also adding new articles into the magazine as well, even after we publish, which is the cool thing about being a digital magazine. So you could always see how our table of contents is changing. But look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where these Zoom interviews go, support my passion project. So thanks for considering. And folks, remember, this was part of a free virtual event where people got to watch the entire movie. So if you want to sign up for those events because you're not on our list, make sure to visit backstory.net slash events and you'll get invites when we do these. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right back into my interview with writer-director Raisuki Hamaguchi about his latest film, Drive My Car. Near the end of the film, his driver um, that's assigned to him by the theater and Yasuki, they, they journey to a location where her family's home was destroyed in a landslide and her mother died. And she also has an incredible monologue about her mother being an abuser, but also having an alternate identity of Sachi, who was nice to her and who she misses. It was a really unique monologue. It was really fascinating. And I'm just curious how it evolved in your mind to get to that point and to write what other than the telling of the story is possibly the other longest monologue in the film. ま、あの、ま、あの、I knew from the beginning that the mother was going to be abusive, the mother of Misaki, um, from the beginning. And as we were sort of creating these characters, and I felt that Misaki was somehow able to speak at the same level as Kafuku, or sometimes maybe even um, with some more depth or sensibility um, than Kafuku. Um, I realized that there was uh, a deep subtext or backstory that was there. And what I always do is I do interviews with the characters. And so as I write out these interviews and uh, imagine the details of their backstory, this story was just one of the things that came out. And it wasn't in the original script, actually. Um, but because the backstory was so vivid and so interesting, um, it made its way into the film and I think became a really strong moment. It was a great moment. And in that same scene, they really share with each other. You know, Masaki admits regret for not acting more to possibly save her mother from the landslide. And Yasuki has regret for not coming home earlier the night that his wife unexpectedly died because he feared that maybe she was going to leave him. He wasn't sure what was going to happen. And it takes really the whole film to get to these profound moments of regret. And I'm curious what the challenges were for you as a writer, finding the balance in that scene, because I'm sure it wasn't easy to write. 
会見としてな会見とあったんです。まあ難しいことをたくさんしているということは、まあ自分でも分かっている。ただまあ先ほども言ったように、まあひたすらインプットをして、まあその無意識に書かせるっていうようなやり方でやっていったときに、まあ書けるときというのは、自然と何か正しい場所にたどり着くような感覚っていうのがあります。で、まあこの二人が、まあどこか似たような過去、あの罪悪感を抱えた、えー、まあ過去というも,ものを抱えているっていうことを理解したときに、あの、この二人の、まあ、おそらく、美咲が口にする言葉っていうのは、下腹にかける言葉というのは、おそらく彼女自身がずっと抱えてきた言葉なんだと思います。で、ただそれは彼女は自分自身にはきっと言えなかったんではないかという気がします。で、この美咲が、まあ、あの、非常に知的で、もう自分自身で過去との折り合いを、まあ、ほとんどつけているようなところがあるんですけれども、それでも、まあ、その、捨てきれない罪悪感みたいなものがあったとき、この、誰か他の人に言うっていうことを通じて、彼女もまた自分の、あの、問題を解決していくんだというふうに思いました。で、それはその、家福にも起こることなわけですね。あの、美咲に大丈夫だと、えー、言ってあげること。それが自分自身に大丈夫だということにもなっていく。そういう構造が、まあ、自然に組み上がっていく。っていう感覚がありました。なので、まあ本当にあの繰り返しになってしまいますけど、一番重要なのは単に考えることではなくて、十分なインプットをしていくことではないかと思います。あの、そのことによって、まあ、自然とどこ、どちらに進むべきかということは、まあ理屈を超えて、あの、ロジックを超えて、まあ分かってくるっていうところがあるというのが、書いている実感です。So overall,、um, there were many difficult aspects to this film. And going back to、um, what I was saying about the whole input, when I am constantly inputting information, then when I can write, it really just works. And when I notice that they have similar regrets in their past, these two characters, I realize that Misaki, she has sort of Always known the words that she needed to tell herself, but wasn't able to tell them to herself. And Kafuku is sort of able to say them because he has had in some way a similar experience. And she's very intelligent, emotionally intelligent,、um, but there were still、uh, aspects of herself that needed to be healed or these sort of inner mysteries that needed to be solved. And so Kafuku telling her, Hey, you're okay, you're going to be okay. Was it actually him also helping himself? And so this all sort of organically emerged. And so I'm going to sound、um, repetitive here, but I really believe that having plenty of input gives you the answer、um, rather than endlessly trying to think through a problem. I believe what's important is to have plenty of input so that it can get worked out organically. I know we're starting to run out of time. So I have two last big questions for you. You know, the first is it's no small feat. To be able to boil down something as dense as Chekhov's play Uncle Vanya to these repeated moments of grief and regret and despair for the future, but also hope for the future. What was your challenge in distilling that so audiences that might not even be familiar with the play understand what's going on in the parallels between the play? And these characters' lives, because that's certainly the other hat trick that you did in this film and did quite well. Well, in the first place, the one who was 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 ワーニャのセリフというものが家福の心情をそのまま表現できると思いました。それは、まあ、自分が望むような人生を得られなかった人たちの話として読むことができると思いました。で、そうすると、このドライマイカーとワーニャおじさんの間にある種の対応関係があることが分かってきます。まあ、家福と美咲の関係はおそらくワーニャとソーニャの関係性に近いものだということも読めてくる。で、そうすると、まあ、あの、この二つを対応づけるようにして物語を進行させればいいということも分かってくる。で、そのためにしたことは、まあ、ひたすらワーニャおじさんの力強いと思われるテキスト部分を、まあ、まず抜き出しておくということです。まあ、それが準備になります。ただ、それが、あの、どのように機能するかというのは分からない状態で、まあ、本当にその、力強い、まあ、心が震えるようなテキストというのをまず抜き出しておくと。で、そうすると、そのドライマイカーという物語を書いているときに、その抜き出しておいた部分、まあ、もしくは自分がほとんど覚えてしまっているような部分というのが、あの、それを、その物語の進行に必要な
時に、まあ、現れるというか、必要な時に、まあ、助けにやってくるっていうような印象っていうのを、あの、持っています。そのようにして、ドライマイカーの物語をあくまでメインとして、このドライ、えー、ワーニャおじさんの話が、あの、サブラインとして、あの、組み上がっていくっていう感覚がありました。First of all, the Uncle Vanya was,、uh, in the original short story as well. And really, the role that it was playing was expressing the Kafuku's feelings that were not easily expressed by his character. And so, in Drive My Car and,、um, Uncle Vanya, I think the parallels there were the main couple, you know, Kafuku and his wife, Oto, were very similar to Vanya and Sonia. And then, What I did in terms of the process was I pulled all of the strong parts of the play. And as I was, it, just the stuff that was really moving to me. And as I was writing Drive My Car, it would appear sort of in parallel. They would sort of inform each other what parts would be included and what parts would not. And so as Drive My Car was the main part and Vanya sort of just came together with that, that was sort of the process. Editing is the last stage of storytelling. Just briefly, what's a scene that fans of the film might be surprised you cut and the lesson from it? One thing is that the Kafuku 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 is that the あの、まあ、のめり込んでくれるのではないだろうかと。もっとより考えてくれるのではないだろうかと思いました。で、結果的にそれはすごく正しかったのではないかと思っています。There was a scene with Kafuku where he was being interviewed why he was doing a multilingual play. And one reason we cut it、uh, was because it was really long. But another reason was because we wanted the audience to get really involved. We wanted the experience of the film To be more experiential, and we wanted the audience to be really intrigued as to why he was doing this multilingual play. So I'm glad that we made that decision, and I think it worked in the end. Last big question for you What was your toughest scene to write on the page, and how did you creatively rise to the challenge? And also, what was your toughest scene as a director on set? <laughs> えー、三崎と家福が話す場面というのがあります。ここは実はもっと長い、えー、会話があった。で、えー、っと、まあ、その高槻の話をどう解釈するかっていうような、えー、ことが書かれていた。ただこれは、まあ、あの、唯一なかなかうまく書けないなと思う場面ではありました。で、結果的に、まあ、撮ってみたものの、まあ、最終的にこの二人が、まあ、多くを語らないことが一番、えー、いいのだという結論に達しました。あまあ、それだけその高槻の場面というのが、まあ、説明不要に素晴らしいものだったということもあるんですけれども、まあ、そこの会話がむしろないことの方が、まあ、正しいのだということが分かって、まあ、うまく書けなかった理由というのも、まあ、その時に分かったような気がしました。で、撮るのが最も大変だった場面は、おそらくまあ雪山の場面でしょうね。それは単純に、まあ、雪の足音、足跡をつけてはいけないという状況もあって、あのスタッフとまあ役者が結構まあ分断されざるを得なかった。え、離れて、まあ、やらざるを得なかったということがあって、すごく感情的なシーンなんだけれども、そういう状態であるっていうのは、まあ、とても大変ではありました。でも、最終的に本当に素晴らしい形で二人とも演じてくれたと思っています。So, in writing,、um, after the scene between、uh, the young Takatsuki and Kafuku in the car, there was actually a much longer scene where Misaki and Kafuku were talking about how they were interpreting what was shared in the story and everything. Um, but it was really difficult to write that scene. And after we shot the scene where they were talking in the car,、um, it just sort of became apparent. Also, just because his performance, Tsukatsuki's、uh, performance was so fantastic, it didn't really need so much explanation. And、um, that moment, I think, made the reason apparent to me in terms of why it was so hard to write, because it wasn't as important as the actual moment that came before it. And in terms of the scene that was most difficult to shoot, filming in the snow for the end of the film was very difficult, mainly just because we couldn't 
make any footprints in the snow, which created this great divide between the crew and the actors. And so it was this very important, intimate scene that we had to be very separate and removed from. So that was a challenge for me as a director. But I think it turned out to be um, a really great scene. It was indeed. And I just I want to thank you for being so generous with your time. I absolutely loved your film. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you very much. Arigato. Thank you for your questions. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to writer-director Ryosuke Hamaguchi for this great interview about his latest film, Drive My Car. And folks, I hope you'll support the film and tell friends about it online. That's what we're doing here. We're getting word of mouth out there for independent filmmakers and, and for films that people might not always know about. They might not be on their radars. It's important to keep everybody connected in sometimes these disconnected times. I also want to thank the studio for making this event possible. This was a virtual event where hundreds of people all over the nation we're able to see the movie and the Q&A in its entirety before this podcast was released. So if you want to join us for these free events in the future, you could sign up at backstory.net slash events, and we would love to have you. You'll get an invite when we have one of these events. Of course, while you're surfing around online, I hope you also check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. You know, we just published our winter issue, our Dune issue. There's so much cool stuff in it. I hope you check out our table of contents. And we even are adding new articles, really big articles, in fact, to the issue after we've published. And we could do that because we're a digital magazine. If you've never read us before, I hope you'll test drive us by reading our free issue over at Backstory.net or through the Backstory app on an iPad. And uh, if you like what you see, I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber. And if you want to subscribe, I'm here to sweeten the deal with discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. It would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these Zoom interviews go, support my passion project. So thanks for considering. The Q&A podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2022. All rights reserved. Folks, if you want to join me on social media, you could find me as Yo Goldsmith on Twitter or Backstory underscore Mag on Twitter. Same for Instagram, actually. Yo Goldsmith on Instagram or Backstory underscore Mag on Instagram. I have a Facebook fan page that you could reach out to. I also have an email address you could send to, which is backstoryletters at gmail.com. I can't always respond immediately, but I do go through the inbox and I love hearing from everybody and responding as much as I can. So feel free to drop me a line anytime. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.